Hey there again, back for another episode of cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. Last episode, we talked substantially about the Warburg effect and Warburg metabolism. And it may, you may wonder why do cancer cells use Warburg metabolism and would it be an advantage to the cancer cell to use Warburg metabolism? So I'm looking at this diagram, which is titled diagram summarizing the different theories behind the preference of Warburg metabolism, Warburg phenomenon, and cancer. In the central thing, we have the theories of you know why cancer cells preferentially use Warburg metabolism, and one of those is that, uh, and it's and it's somewhat interesting because for me, if you actually look at these, it looks like some of these are just the outpourings of what drives Warburg metabolism versus what is actually the benefits. So I'm going to start with what the benefits are to the cancer cell. Aerobic glycolysis generates ATP faster than oxidative phosphorylation. That's one potential reason why the cancer cells would prefer aerobic glycolysis. The second one would be selective anabolic advantage of aerobic glycolysis and promoting tumor cell proliferation by supplying the required biosynthetic molecules. So this is another possible benefit to cancer cells using the Warburg effect. Another possible advantage would be the adaptive response to hypoxic conditions and tumor microenvironment through HIF-1-alpha pathway. We're going to see this later on when we talk about HIF-1-alpha and cancer, and particularly HIF-1-alpha as a driver of the Warburg effect. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the uh, strategies in metabolic therapy for cancer is based off of trying to reduce and or block HIF-1-alpha because of its effect and driving the Warburg effect, mostly through the expression of glycolytic enzymes using glycolysis, but also in the expression and activation of this PDK, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, and in blocking PDC, which is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. This is basically PDC, as we'll look at in other diagrams, is basically the important enzyme that brings pyruvate into the mitochondria and converts it to acetyl-CoA. And when this is blocked or downregulated, it's going to shuttle pyruvate to lactate, driving tumor acidosis, which then, interestingly enough, drives HIF-1-alpha further because the cell thinks it's hypoxic and it's a snowball effect. The other one it's talking about here is mitochondrial dysfunction leading to low oxidative phosphorylation activity. I think this is more likely what is causing the Warburg effect, let alone not necessarily what's pref why it preferentially uses the Warburg effect. But I would also say that this little bubble of mitochondrial dysfunction leading to low oxidative phosphorylation activity is true, but it's more likely the mitochondrial dysfunction leading to excessive reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress leading to the increase in HIF-1-alpha. But we'll talk about that in detail. So we're going to look at something that Dr. Seafree calls the oncogenic paradox. I'm going to try to walk us through this one thing at a time. So let's pretend this green circle here with the squiggly lines is a healthy mitochondria making tons of ATP and allowing us to live normal, healthy lives. This is a very simplistic diagram. So don't think of this as all of the reasons why mitochondrial are damaged, but it's saying that carcinogens, radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, mutations in mitochondrial DNA, viruses, age, et cetera, will take a normally functioning mitochondria and start to transform it into a less functioning mitochondria. And as these mitochondria start to become less and less normal, the cristae are more, more disorganized or absent, you produce less ATP and more reactive oxygen species, ROS. As you can see here, this correlates perfectly with a normal mitochondria here, producing lots of ATP and a vacuolated, dysfunctional and deformed mitochondria producing very low ATP. What's missing from this diagram, I believe would be very helpful as, as, as substrate level phosphorylation goes up, you're also going to see a stark rise in ROS. And ROS is this big red thing here, which stands for, again, reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress has an arrow that goes back towards the mitochondria smartly because ROS is probably one of the main drivers of why mitochondria become dysfunctional by damaging mitochondrial DNA, which we'll talk about in the mitochondrial heteroplasmy series, but and also damaging nuclear DNA, which then leads to genetic mutations that ultimately drive 
cancer and un uncontrolled growth. So this is a really nice picture of how mitochondrial dysfunction is likely the precursor to all the downstream effects we see in cancer. This is another paper which states that interestingly, a relatively poor explored aspect of mitochondria and neoplastic disease, cancer, in is their contribution to the characteristic genomic instability that underlies the evolution of the disease. In this review, we summarize the known mechanisms by which mitochondrial alterations in cancer tolerate and support the accumulation of DNA mutations, which leads to genomic instability. So what we have here is we have a, we have a, a mitochondria and it is producing reactive oxygen species when it becomes more damaged in excess, which leads to single base alterations, double-stranded breaks, and problems in replication, which lead to, in this case, genomic instability and cancer. However, what is missing here is that what probably is first happening is that the ROS or the reactive oxygen species are likely damaging the mitochondrial DNA, which is much less protected within the mitochondria, which leads to decrease in bioenergetics, more ROS, which also damages the, the nuclear DNA. But that can be a discussion for another day. Again, another picture of altered mitochondria, increased ROS, DNA damage, DNA damage also further damaging the mitochondria. And then ultimately you have mutations, mutation accumulation, and progression of disease. This is a nice summary slide of how important mitochondria are. So as you can see, mitochondria here, important for oxidative phosphorylation, the metabolism of glucose, fatty acids, and proteins to make ATP, water, reactive oxygen species, control temperature, et cetera. And there are many things. This box is highlighted and it's definitely true, but it's also not exhaustive in terms of how DNA, how mitochondria are damaged, but excessive food intake, glucose intake, sedentary lifestyle, inflammation, loneliness, chemical agents such as pharmaceuticals and drugs and radiation all damage mitochondria, which then lead to uh, the Warburg effect becoming predominant in some cells, which can lead to all kinds of chronic diseases, which is why I'm so adamant about, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction as being the etiology or the, the creation of all disease likely. But in particular, in this series, we're talking about cancer. So later on, we'll talk about glycolytic reprogramming, anti-Warburg effect. It would be pretty depressing if we talked about all these biochemical pathways of how cancer is programmed and, and works without having an antidote to that. So until next time.